arrange the sounds according to their loudness or according to their pitch on a single gradient. But if we define timbre as the residuals, there's no muchness of that that I, I, defies abstraction. Um, and you know, an, another sense in which those pitch and loudness percepts are simple is that we know immediately how to assign them to the straightforward physical parameters of, of frequency and the overall amplitude. So just the, the history of the acousticians starting to work on this problem is really driven by their desire to attribute the more spectral aspects of timbre or the more temporal aspects to different physical you know, um, parts of the signal that they could describe really easily. But the problem that we get out of this is that these combined lists of gradients we know are incomplete, they have redundancies, and the features that go into timbre really interact in complex ways. So um, we tried to get a, our, to find our way around these problems by first using a large set of sounds to define the dimensionality of the per perception within orchestra tones, just the sustained tones, and then to use this new numerical way of representing the sound, which is the modulation power spectrum that Geoffroy introduced so, so wonderfully for us. Um, its advantage is that it's quantitatively rigorous about the physical correlates, and it's also going to unify the spectral and the temporal domains in a single space. So if we have to use one tool, let's see what we can make of this one. Um, so my project then is divided into these two parts. First of all, I'll tell you about the perceptual mapping, um, and then we'll get into the spectrotemporal modulations that correlate with each of those percepts. Um, so how to enumerate how many of the percepts listeners actually agree on in a perceptual chamber space. So we were taking 42 of the orchestral sustained sounds from the McGillifrand Library, and because the pairwise comparisons of that is 861, we broke that set into smaller subsets of just 28 sounds, which is comfortably what a listener can do in two hours. So we had overlapping sets, subsets between um, the individual subjects, um, and we had normalized these sounds to the E flat and their duration and their level. Um, and then, you know, following the researchers that have been described before, subjects just have to pick a number on this particular rating scale. How similar are those two tones that you just heard in timbre? And you can play them as often as you like. Um, and then later, you hear the sound signally, singly and have to place them on these rating scales between descriptors. Um, of course, this task needs to come second so that it doesn't bias your criteria for the similarity in the first place. And for that reason, we ask that all of the subjects have at least <coughs> two years of some kind of musical training beyond school, um, just so that they might have some commonality in knowing what we meant by any of those words. Um, so we come down to the pleasant unpleasant here, which of course is not as well defined as Jim was talking about this morning. Um, so many of you are familiar with this, but let's uh, think about the dimensionality in the perceptual space. Multidimensional scaling is this way of plotting individual objects, which are the sounds from the instruments in this case, in such a way that similar ones are going to lie close together within the space. So, if we were to play the same piano key with the same touch at three different loudnesses, we might represent the differences, the distances here, A, B, and B, C, and A, C as well. Would, they would fall on a line because there's basically only one dimension in which they differ. But if we started to add other piano keys to that, we could expect that these smaller differences between the pairs of tones might be greater than a C, you know, forming this kind of triangle of relations, which is to start you off noticing the pattern that for any N stimuli, we could represent it with N one minus dimensions. But it's really an empirical question of whether all of those dimensions are sufficient. 
are there regular patterns that we can describe in a smaller number of dimensions is the question. And so we devised a way of cross-validating in order to answer that question. And we came up with this answer that there are five dimensions in the orchestral sustained tones. Um, so let me show you how we did that. This is the cross-validation. As we increase the number of dimensions on the x-axis here, of course the fit improves. And that's the black line here, so it's ever increasing. But if we do a cross-validation where we hold out, say, subject 33, and use the perceptual map created based on subjects 1 through 32, we can ask how well does that map predict the configuration of left out subject 33. And those are the dots in this plot. So they don't rise monotonically. They're plateauing at about five dimensions, which is this red reference line here. So that was our initial reason for thinking that there were really only five dimensions. Um, then we proceeded to do an AIC analysis and a discriminant function analysis. And all of the results came up with five. So that's how, how we ended up with that strong claim. Um, and this is the first two, just the first two dimensions of that five dimensional perceptual space with the first dimension going in arbitrary units from the flutes over here to the cornet and the second dimension coming from a trombone to the cello. The clustering makes some sense in terms of the instrument families, which is what's color-coded here, but the exceptions, of course, are reassuring because they mean that subjects aren't responding just to some named categories of instrument families that they know, but rather on some perceptual basis. Um, and then we use the procrustes reflection and rotation that you've also heard about to project this space onto the musical descriptors so that we can have some intuitive handle on what these dimensions mean. And it did so happen that there, there was a similar dimensionality of that space. Um, and we came up with hardness for the first dimension and something having to do with stability, the tremolo on the second dimension. Um, so to introduce you just briefly to the other three dimensions, the tesseract is a cute way of reminding you that it's hard to visualize more than three dimensions. Um, but I'll just play you the instrument extremes. So for the first dimension of hardness, second dimension varying level, the third dimension was noisy versus tonal, scattered versus compact, and this is the crumb horn you can see outside. Oops. The fifth dimension had no semantic descriptors significantly associated with it, which means that I hadn't come to this workshop soon enough and didn't have enough names, I'm sure, but I noticed after the fact that it separated the brass and the reeds, so that's how I think of it. The nameless. Okay, so now we can ask what physical basis is there in sound for these five different percepts? And to address that, I'm going to give you a feel for this more useful representation of sounds, the modulation power spectrum. And it's going to be unifying the domains in such a way that frees us to use the whole dynamic recordings. Maybe this is obvious to you by now, um, but that is a great benefit um, on top of the quantitative rigor that it allows us to, to keep um, in an, so that we could describe complexity in an economical way. Um, and this is the classic spectrogram visualization of a clarinet sound that I'm really going to use to, to, to try to make sure that you know what I mean by modulations, um, which is also something that I'm sure many of you do. But if, if we look at this plot, there's a lot of detail. It's very colored, even on the poor projection. Um, and there is a really obvious visual structure associated with the pitch. So we have the fundamental and then the harmonic stacking on top of that. It's very also obvious, I think, when the onset comes and when the decay starts. And so the one second duration is very plain here. I'm going to try to, to claim that the modulations are just as obvious of a structure within this plot 
that for the brain, there aren't as many isolated events as there are pixels in this plot, but instead there are these overall fluctuations of power that we refer to, it's the 2D FFT of the log spectrogram, also for those of you for whom that made sense. Um, usually, you know, musicians and people in this field are very familiar with the temporal modulations, the fluctuation of power horizontally through the plot, but in a completely analogous way, if we take vertical cross-sections, there are oscillations of power going up the y-axis across many kilohertz, and those will be in units of cycles per kilohertz. Um, and it's just completely analogous. You can think of them in a similar way, although it takes usually some getting used to before you, you feel like you know what you mean by them. So the simplest way to explain it is to take a, set, a noise that's been filtered to have only one spectral modulation present, and this is one of those ripples that Jeff Wall was talking about. That's pitchy, that's pure pitch. Maybe it wasn't very convincing to you that it was pitchy because of the instability, which you can also see somewhat in the spectrogram coming in and out, even though the, obviously the, the red bars of, of the components are, are very stable. So here's a melody to pr prove you the pitch. Okay, the basic of elementary pitch perception. And then the counterpart sound would be these ripples that have been filtered to have only one regular onset, you know, of, of these bursts in time. Um, so, it takes <coughs> you more than 20 minutes to really read a lot of the details we would want to see in this representation, but the modulation power spectrum is useful in plotting the oscillations both in time and frequency together without a trade-off in resolution. Um, so we can think of it as a complete representation of, town, of, of sound um, that's really joining those separate elementary features together. Um, if you were to combine the spectral modulation I played you with the temporal modulation, um, the spectral modulation would plot to two cycles per kilohertz. Um, the temporal modulation is about 20 hertz. And when we put them together, we get a down sweep ripple. Uh, which you would need a lot of power in, for example, in the vibrato in this singer's voice. You'd need the upsweeps as well. So the right quadrant is filled with downsweeps and the left quadrant with upsweeps. Um, and now I'm going to take this representation and replace the pink and blue stars with the actual acoustic details from individual instruments. And one of the first things that you should hope to be able to read in the modulation power spectrum for each of these is that there's a red peak that's associated with the harmonic spacing of the components, so that's because of the E-flat that we normalized all of these two. And also, when you have sounds like this particular bass flute that had vibrato, there's a lot more spread of the power horizontally in the plot, and that's because of that instability, there are more fast changes. So I'm going to try to orient you quickly to um, just a couple of the, <coughs> the really simple um, acoustic cues we look for. So some of the components have relatively more power than others. If we take a vertical cross-section through this plot, that's the power spectral density, and the formats are pretty far apart. So that's plotting to a low spectral modulation. This is counterintuitive for some people. Um, whereas the clarinet that people have mentioned has alternating components boosted in power, those formants, of course, are closer together, so it's kind of an intermediate format that's not quite as high as the one that's associated with the pitch. Um, so we can look for those. Also, the transient noise attacks, like the, the um, breathy pan flute, has this down sweep you know, associated with that that gets to some faster modulations. Okay, so those were you know, sort of a walk through individual sounds. But now we want to look at what are the acoustic correlates for these dimensions as a whole. And to do that, um, we're, instead of doing a laundry list, um, these are interesting colors, <laughs> going, we're going to do a mathematical comparison between the acoustic representation that I've introduced to you and the perceptual space. Um, and for those of you that, that will understand how we did this, it's a ridge regression with 20 of the principal components of the modulations. And we also used these traditional acoustic descriptors, which Jeff I think would call summary statistics, so fairly basic. Um, 
And I'm just going to overlay them one at a time so you can see what parts of the modulation space are going along with hardness, in this case, D1, all the blue. Um, and I'm circling in red the areas that change the most as we move acro across that space between instruments far apart and hardness. Um, dimension 2, varying level, is separable in addition to its perceptual orthogonality. And it's not surprising to us that the peaks of change here are somewhere around 6 hertz because that's about the rate of vibrato and winds and strings, um, what players like to perform. Um, let's see, so pureness, you might have thought would be a purely spectral parameter, but the advantage of this representation is that it's jointly spectrotemporal, and you can see it clearly demarcated in this space, so one could proceed to manipulate that. Um, the fifth dimension is subtle, the black areas, but it's significant, both acoustically and perceptually, even though the semantic descriptors didn't, didn't come up with anything for it. So you may have noticed I skipped the third dimension. That's because it was the only dimension that didn't have any modulation significantly associated with it. Instead, <coughs> it was well described by this spectral centroid, the mean spectrum measure, um, which you can think of as being related to the modulation power spectrum as the phase. So that's why it's not represented in, in that um, plotting of things. So just kind of to sum up here, I've tried to convince you that, there's, that there really is a limited dimensionality to this space that listeners agree on, um, and that it's five. And <laughs> that we, we can begin to describe acoustic correlates for, for all of these dimensions. I have Mighty Mouse here as a reference to the Mighty Wurlitzer, um, just to say that I'm really encouraged to hear Etienne Thore's talk after mine, where he's begun to filter these sounds so that we, we can learn about their perceptual constancy and importance for listeners, and I hope in the future also to see extremes that are driven by these kinds of acoustic analysis. Um, so just a moment on my background, I am a neurophysiologist, um, and there is, as has already been pointed out, a good correlation between these modulation representations of neural receptive fields. So this is a plot of an ensemble of neurons in the higher areas of the, the zebra finch brain. And their power, you know, the, the black line shows the power in zebra finch vocalizations, but obviously they listen to a lot of natural sounds as well. And so there's this spread that really tiles the range of modulations that we say are most important for timbre and for speech, for example. And this is the frog that I would like to record in. And finally, I just really need to thank my mentor, Frederick Tunison, again, David Wessel, who's also at Berkeley, and we've got to talk to quite a bit, and the students who work on this project. This is the desert. It looks much better in full color, <laughs> but I do find frogs there. So, thank you. <laughs>
So you, you understand the difference? So I was wondering why did you use the MPS and how do you compare that to the uh, spectrotemporal receptive field? So the spectrotemporal receptive fields, um, Munya is going to go into in, in her talk, um, those receptive fields are looking, uh, are best driven by parts of the modulation space. So I'm, I, I do feel that I have lost a grasp on your question. <laughs> yeah, um, because you, you, uh, basically when you do the 2D Fourier transform of the whole spectrogram, the log, uh, yeah, the log uh, spectrogram, everything yeah. is merged because it's, you don't have any oh, right. locality in frequency or in time. It's just like uh, you can do the 2D, 2D Fourier transform of the, this image or just the upper part uh, the left upper part, which will be the receptive fields version. Oh, right, so, okay. uh, you, you know, it's the fact that you merge everything together. So, all after what, what it is. Right, implies. which is sort of an output that could um, be computed by many filters, many receptive fields. Um, so, that's, I'm sorry, I've lost something that's really through my mind. <laughs> Oh, but I mean, you, you, you lose the locality of the information in frequency. So, like, so for after example, since you try to imply concepts like as dark or stuff like that, maybe it will be a bit. Uh, oh, like if we shifted everything in pitch, for example, we would still have the same. Is that what you're thinking of? Yeah. And the attacks yeah, actually, yes, yes, on yes, the if you just so shift, it will right. be the same. Right, yeah. So, and I tried doing this analysis just on the first half of the sounds versus the second to see if because attacks are so important to listeners and we form this causal hypothesis from the attack, would that be a better descriptor? But they were short and, I, and the cutoff in the middle of the sound was a real problem for me and so I abandoned ship. But maybe you can think of a better way to add that. Yeah, Munya? I think it's really just, you basically know that there is four hertz in that signal but you don't know where it is. Okay. So that's, it's the difference between taking a Fourier transform and a okay. short term Fourier yeah. transform. So you know that there is 200 hertz, but you just don't know where it is. It's the same thing. So when you take the modulation spectrum, you know there is 4 hertz, but you just can't tell where it is in the signal. So if you care about onsets and transients, you can't tell where they are, but they are represented in the, in yeah, the modulation I, I, spectrum. You just don't know where. I it agree is. with the shift in variance in time, but with the 2D Fourier transform, you also have shift in variance in frequency. So that They're means all whether. Anyway. Sorry? <laughs> Well, they were all normalized to the, to the same pitch in this case, too. Okay. Does that, you know? Pop <laughs> We can touch later, but that's very okay, interesting. Okay, yeah, thank you. Some more questions? Oh, yes. Um, you, you were very definitive about, uh, about the five dimensions. Yeah. Uh, so I thought you could move on to the question. Um, oh, yeah, so <laughs> bring it on. <laughs> Like, do you believe there are no more dimensions, or is it just your limited of deceiving given, given... Given the subjects that we have, yeah. No, I mean, don't you think that audio engineers could train themselves to listen to more than this? Yes, I do, but, but maybe in their overall gestalt judgments, they're not salient? I don't know, maybe it becomes a task, I'm looking at Yulia, because we could attend to other features if we had a reason to. Well, I, I wonder if, if we could synthesize other sounds that, that would seem quite different, even though they lined up in the acoustical measures. We could synthesize different sounds that, that, just say it again, I'm sorry. Could, could, could we synthesize sounds that, that all be very similar to some of the uh, instruments that might actually be perceived to be quite, quite different? Or, sure, yeah, no. Um, what kind of difference do you want, I guess, is the first question. And But, but yeah, why not? That's not to be none. But <laughs> <laughs> uh, really, I mean, I, yeah, I, I, I do expect that there would be a different yeah. dimensionality for, this is why I want to try the gamelan, you know, um, and environmental sounds. There are many other things that we're good at listening at. Maybe we make meaning differently with them. 